Uh, she came to Georgia Tech in 2008, where she is currently a professor in the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering, as well as appointments in chemistry and biochemistry and materials science and engineering. Uh, in 1995, she was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. Um, she is, uh, was the president of the American Chemical Society in 2003 and has won num numerous awards from the ACS. Uh, she is also an ACS fellow as well as a fellow of the AAAS and the Royal Society of Chemistry. And it's a real pleasure to have Elsa with us. David, thank you. And it's really a pleasure for me to be here. And I kind of remember being giving a seminar almost precisely two years ago um, when we had a snowstorm that was just beginning. So we, we missed it this time. but. The timing is kind of interesting. So hopefully it won't start snowing out there, and I think it is a little bit, it's, it's warm enough that it should. All right, so can everybody in back hear me all right? Yes? Good. All right, so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about research um, that's going on in my group, but also collaborations uh, with a number of other groups related to kind of developing structure, process, property relationships for solution process semiconductors. All right, and, and the motivation of this, if I can work this properly, is that, yeah, silicon technology and basically inorganic materials device technology has been around for a while. All right, so starting with uh, the first germanium transistor that was developed at Bell Labs uh, in the 1940s time frame. Uh, things have certainly advanced in terms of initially microfabrication, now nanofabrication, uh, where silicon devices now have features that are, oh, approaching 10, 15 nanometers in size. Um, just to put that in perspective, when I started working in the area of photolithographic materials at Bell Labs, uh, it was a really big deal to have half micron or quarter micron images. And with relation to, let's say, an E. coli bacterium cell uh, that's about a micron by five microns across, those features seem pretty small. And then a human hair is roughly 100 microns in diameter. So silicon devices today are, the, Im the feature sizes are really tiny. Uh, it's really costly uh, to fabricate those devices, considering that it's all subtractive processing for the most part, on very large single crystal silicon substrates. Yeah, there's a lot these devices can do but every application doesn't need the power of silicon or other inorganic materials. So that led to interest in what typically has been called plastic electronics or flexible electronics. Can we now do something with devices made out of flexible organic or polymer materials, use them on flexible substrates, and they could be effective for things that don't need silicon technology. All right, maybe for a display that's gonna be conformable, a display that could be rolled up and you know, lightweight and you just bring it with you very easily. Uh, solar cells that could be rolled up and laid out for you know, a power source at some point. Um, medical, biomedical devices. Uh, integrated sensors that could be stretchable, flexible, and biocompatible. All right, so that led to a lot of interest in developing organic semiconductors. All right, and there are a lot of things that we need to think about in the development of organic materials. Uh, certainly, I don't want to blind you, sorry. Uh, we need to think about the materials. Let me move over here. Um, how do you design the material to have effective charge transport characteristics? Uh, the devices, are the actual configurations of devices and the device designs going to be 
effectively the same for organic materials versus inorganic materials. And then the processing. How do you actually control these large organic floppy molecules in solution as solvents evaporating to provide the morphology that we're going to need for effective charge transport? All right, and initially, there's a ton of work in designing new materials, in looking at the device physics, much less work associated with the processing. I, because most of the people doing this work largely were applied physicists. Um, from the chemistry perspective, the materials perspective, most of the people doing the work were organic chemists who like to synthesize things. And there'd be a lot of beautiful synthetic procedures, lots of neat molecules being prepared, but in very small quantities. And results from one lab to another lab just were not reproducible. All right, and that's largely because the processes weren't controlled. And so I came to looking at organic semiconductors more from the process standpoint based on the experience I had with lithographic materials and processes and developing systems that could be used in a manufacturing environment where if you think about how silicon devices are fabricated, there has to be a lot of control and precision associated with those processes. And so can we now develop the solution-based processes required for organic materials to really behave reproducibly and hopefully be developed into a manufacturable system. All right, so you know, I mentioned before that there are a lot of possible opportunities for polymers in electronics and photonics, uh, whether biomedical sensors, um, possible displays, stretchable electronics. Uh, we could use relatively accessible, inexpensive roll-to-roll -roll processing techniques, fabrication techniques that uh, this particular uh, piece of equipment is a gravure printer. It's the way newsprint is being printed every day. All right, so it's inexpensive, low, low cost, very high throughput, and you could use very large areas. Something that you can't do with silicon. All right, the issue though is, as you can see in this AFM image, sort of what the morphology looks like. And there really isn't any firm basis yet for knowing exactly what morphology we really do want to have to optimize performance in a reproducible way. All right, so polymer materials for flexible devices. We wanted to develop the fundamental structure process property relationships so that those relationships could guide the design of robust materials and processes. And we also wanted to identify and utilize sort of the fundamental mechanisms that are associated with thin film morphology evolution from a solution. All right, so thinking about that, you know, first thing is to think about order and disorder. All right, if you look at these AFM images, each one of them shows a thin film morphology, surface morphology, that's slightly different. All right, and if you had different materials, yeah, okay. They're different, so they're likely to behave differently. In this particular case, they're all taken, they're all done using the exact same polymer. And not only just the exact same polymer from different batches, the exact same polymer from one batch of material taken from the same bottle of material. Just processed differently. Uh, a couple of them may have been just processed on different days. All right, so 
this says right up front that the process characteristics and how you process the material makes a really big difference in terms of what you get in that thin film. And that makes a big difference in what the performance is going to be. All right, so with this solution process material, what is the mechanism of conducting channel formation? All right, how do we control the microstructure? Um, what is the role of crystallinity? Do we want a perfectly crystalline material? Or do we want a partial, partly crystalline material? And then in terms of conjugation for these polymer chains, you know, we're thinking about interchain conjugation and intrachain effects. So which is more important and how do we balance all of these different factors? All right, so there it goes. Ah. All right, so polymer, the semiconducting polymer properties very much depend on that final thin film morphology. That morphology is process dependent, and we don't really know how that morphology develops as the thin film is forming. All right, so microstructure having an impact on semiconducting properties in polymers has been studied for a while. All right, so Seringhaus talked about radioregularity or how the monomer units in this polymer are arranged, having an impact on performance. Um, Klein talked about molecular weight effects where low molecular weight material uh, was more crystalline but didn't behave as well as higher molecular weight material. And Kim and his coworkers looked at uh, functionalizing the dielectric surface of these transistors and that making an impact in the organization of the polymer and thus performance. All right, so what is the role of microstructure? And then how can that microstructure be tuned reproducibly so that we have a manufacturable process? This doesn't want to cooperate with me. All right, so if we look at conducting channel formation, all right, we have a thin film transistor architecture where uh, we're using endoped silicon as the gate electrode. Uh, silicon oxide is a dielectric. We have gold source drain uh, electrodes, and we're depositing our semiconductor. All right, we start with a solution. It undergoes a number of phase transitions, and we have our device. Ideally, the polymer chains will all be stacked up nice and neat along this channel, and we have perfect transport characteristics. That's the ideal case, not the real case. All right, so we started looking at the process in solution, and we were taking drain current measurements as solvent was evaporating. And we find that the drain current fluctuates as that film is forming. So the polymer chains are rearranging as a function of time. There are percolation effects. There are bulk effects that are taking place in the film. There are interface effects with the substrate. And all of that is going to influence how that final microstructure evolves. All right, so looking at that system simultaneously from the electrical perspective, coupled with spectroscopic interrogation and working with Mohan Srinivasaro from uh, material science here, we, we developed a way of being able to interrogate the center of a device at the same time that we're looking, doing Raman spectroscopy measurements to try to correlate these changes in the semiconducting performance spectroscopically with what's going on to, in the polymer system in solution. All right, and we used poly-3-hexylthiophene. The solvent was trichlorobenzene. Not a very good solvent for a manufacturing environment, but it's good for 
studying this particular system. And the reason we did that is it's a high boiling point solvent, so we don't have to worry about any dynamic effects of the solvent evaporation from that droplet. All right, and the time was set so that we could actually accumulate the Raman spectra. All right, so what we find from the uh, conducting channel measurements is that you know, it takes about 12, 14 hours for this droplet to, for the solvent to evaporate and have a solidified droplet. Um, about 10 hours in, uh, we see a very steep rise in drain current. And, you know, there are distinct areas in this rise where the behavior is a little bit different. Right? And if we look at the Raman spectra at the same time, uh, we can do um, polarized Raman spectroscopy, and based on those measurements, we can see that there appears to be a liquid crystalline phase that the system is going through at some point prior to having a solidified film. Uh, we also dis see distinct differences between the isotropic solution and ultimately the crystalline phase when solvent is evaporated. All right, so we do have a lyotropic liquid crystalline phase that's being formed. Uh, there is long range order within that LC phase. And so if we can actually control and take advantage of the liquid crystallinity in this system, are there positive consequences for macroscopic charge transport? All right, so we started looking at the um, liquid crystal characteristics of poly-3-hexylthiophene in solution. All right, and then this, this continued to be in collaboration with Mohan Srinivasaro. All right, so, yeah, we see that during solvent evaporation, we do form a lyotropic liquid crystalline phase. We can take a solution of P3HT, approximate the concentration that we anticipate seeing this LC phase, and just let it sit around. All right? Over time, the solution changes. We can see that there are uh, lower energy bands being formed over, in this case, a three-day period. And these absorption bands are indicative of H aggregates being formed so that we're seeing P3HT aggregating into structures. Polarized optical microscopy shows that the aged P3HT solutions have long range order and monodomain characteristics. All right, so P3HT aggregates, those aggregates are elongated and they order in solution. That part is partially good from a sort of device fabrication perspective. It's actually not totally good because a solution that changes over time isn't going to be particularly user friendly in a production environment. So what else is going on and how can we now control it? All right, so this just demonstrates again that over a period of days, in this case, 36 days, we do see uh, sort of aging induced birefringence showing monodomain like character. Uh, birefringence evolves over time and it becomes strongest around about a month into this aging process. All right, and we can do dichroic measurements, again, that confirm that these are ordered elongated structures. All right, so that's an issue that going forward is going to need to be dealt with, but we do have aggregated structures that can be ordered. Can we now develop process techniques to influence that ordering and maintain ordering on a macroscopic scale so that we can manipulate, influence, and control 
the charge transport characteristics for a device. All right, so there are a number of ways that we've been looking at in the group to sort of aggregate poly-3-hexylthiophene. Right, these include ultrasonication. I think the battery's going on the pointer. Ultrasonication using co-solvents. We've shown that we can use low-dose UV irradiation to induce ordering and aggregation. Uh, we can combine these methodologies. And we've also explored the use of Hansen solubility parameters to try to optimize the solvent with the semiconducting polymer to have a system that maybe will more optimally form these aggregates in an interconnected way for macroscopic transport. All right, this shows um, crystallinity can be manipulated by changing the solvent. Uh, this shows the kind of analysis you can get using the Hansen solubility parameters. All right, and you can get a nicely organized, uh, very high fiber content thin film morphology by manipulating the material in solution. All right, so we looked a little bit more closely at P3HT aggregation and the impact of a couple of techniques, particularly adding a poor solvent, coupling that with the use of ultrasonication to induce aggregation. All right, and by changing the actual process conditions, yet you can get changes in that overall morphology. And some of those morphologies are better, some are not better for charge transport. All right, and that allowed us to start thinking about the aggregation process and the evolution process for the ultimate thin film in terms of crystallization. We could go back to crystallization of polyethylene where it's pretty well understood how polyethylene crystallizes. Uh, we really need to think about sort of the concentration of the polymer in the solution, um, whether it's in the undersaturated regime, an unstable zone where everything just falls out of solution, or in a metastable zone, which is where we most likely want to operate to be able to control that aggregation step. All right, so that led us to propose a relatively straightforward two-step crystallization mechanism for P3HT during this solvent evolution process, which is a process that's been investigated for many polymer, crystalline polymer materials in the past then we could t build on that system. And this is work of a student who was visiting from China um, up until last October, where we could now think about that crystallization process, think about the temperature of how we're treating that solution and how we further manipulate the system and he developed a microfluidic approach where we use a cooling bath to induce nucleation. And then using UV light, we can grow those nuclea nucleation sites into larger fibrillar structures. And then also we have a shear induced flow that also optimizes growth of those fibers. All right, and then with that process, we were able to develop solutions that had very long integrated polymer fibers, and we could optimize the process in order to get very high mobilities in poly-3-hexylthiophene, which averaged about 0.16 centimeters square per volt set. Not great if you compare it to silicon, but for many applications like displays where you don't need that high mobility, it's perfectly adequate. 
if we do um, sort of UV vis analysis and GWAX analysis, all right, we can see that we, we definitely are forming very well-ordered aggregates in the solution. Uh, those aggregates from the GWAX analysis are also very highly crystalline. Uh, and if we look at the sort of the, this is UV analysis, uh, the exciton bandwidth, uh, goes down, which is an indicator that there is a much longer conjugation length in these systems. Uh, and then the pi-pi stacking distance of the polymer backbones decreases, again good for charge transport, and the Hermann's orientation factor be, uh, approaches uh, almost perfect uh, perpendicular stacking of the polymer backbones to the device substrate, right? All of which says that we should have a system that has better charge transport characteristics in a transistor device, and the results point to, yeah, that's what we've got. All right. Um, that process is also versatile. Uh, this wasn't optimized, but it also was successful in promoting the uh, charge transport characteristics of an electron transport material, not just a whole transport material. And so I think what we're thinking about in terms of the crystallization mechanism, in terms of how uh, fibers grow and orient in solution is applicable not just to poly-3-hexylthiophene, but is also applicable to alternative polymer systems that may have better performance and also may be more durable than P3HT is. All right, um, we could go on further and show that with uh, that microfluidic approach, uh, we do end up with materials that are ordered, ordered based on polarized optical microscopy results. Uh, and we get that long range orientation under flow conditions. And then if we start to look at the fiber structure and do a little bit of image analysis on the AFM images, we see that we have what could be called bundles of fiber in solution. And that made us think about um, what known in the polymer crystallization literature as a shish kebab mechanism of fiber growth, where with these fibers, there are other, po other parts of the polymer chain, sort of an elongated section of the polymer chain that additional fibers are growing from. And these so-called tie chains could be leading to this bundling effect. All right, and this is something which we're continuing to investigate further, largely through a collaboration with Martha Grover, also in uh, the chemical engineering department. All right, so this has all been fine. Um, we can manipulate through processing. We can get better performance of P3HT. We think we can do this on other polymer systems, but there's still a problem with these approaches that the solvents are typically chloroform, chlorobenzene, trichlorobenzene, and nobody in their right mind is gonna to wanna to use those solvents in a large-scale, high-throughput fabrication environment. So what else could we do? So in, an, in a recent project with Paul Russo in MSE, we started looking at proteins, which can be very nicely dispersed in an aqueous environment. And can those proteins now assist in the organization 
of a conjugated polymer like P3HT so that ultimately we may have some sort of aqueous based, almost latex like paint processing approach where the protein helps with the assembly of the polymer. It's all nicely dispersed in water, and then you can deposit from effectively water. Right, so we started looking at um, a fungal protein called serrato ulmin uh, that effectively is a Janus-like particle, uh, and it forms very strong biofilms when dispersed in water. It's been known that it will also encapsulate oils, solvents, etc. So if we take poly-3-hexylthiathene and some solvent, disperse it in this aqueous-based protein mixture, P3HT gets encapsulated. Over time, those capsules sort of merge and form dendritic structures. Uh, we can get uh, crystalline structures forming, and it sort of points towards the future of when, yeah, we may be able to develop biocompatible systems. We may be able to develop systems that can be uh, deposited from an aqueous medium. These materials could also be handled with an additive manufacturing technique where we could specifically deposit the active material on a substrate that's moving. Uh, so there are a lot of different things that we can now start thinking about given that we can form very ordered crystalline P3HT through the protein-assisted method. We can also do some other things related to blending the polymers with alternative materials. Uh, one example was if we take poly-3-hexylthiophene, have it um, highly crystalline where we do see enhanced mobility, the problem is that it's not very mechanically stable. So yeah, you're not going to be able to use this for any kind of flexible, stretchable device. Well, you take 1% of that pretreated poly-3-hexylthiophene, blend it with polydimethylsiloxane. During that curing process, we end up with a composite system that is very stretchable. Right, the interesting thing about that system also is that in that blend, the performance of P3HT is substantially higher. Right, so the PDMS, which is a non-solvent, doesn't like to interact with P3HT, forces P3HT into more ordered aligned structures that exhibit very high mobility. All right, if you just take P3HT that hasn't been treated, mix it with PDMS, you get no mobility. All right, and if we look at that uh, from AFM images of both the air interface and the substrate interface, this is straight P3HT that's been processed, no other additives, and the air and substrate interfaces are pretty similar. The PDMS system, though, the air interface is almost entirely PDMS, while the substrate interface shows this dendritic fibrous network of P3HT. All right, so the PDMS is influencing the organization of P3HT, and fortuitously, it's also enabling that organization in a much better connected, ordered structure than the 100% material. 
All right, so the steps that we have to take here now are to show that to integrate this with an actual stretchable device and show that upon stretching, we also maintain the performance characteristics. And then in some additional work, uh, we also looked at blending radioregular P3HT, which is P3HT that does have charge transport characteristics, with radio-random P3HT, which doesn't really transport charges. All right, and being able to use them on a flexible polyethylene terephthalate substrate, basically mylar that used to be used for overhead transparencies, we're able to develop a flexible device on plastic that maintains its mobility up to about 80% 80, 80 of the radio-random material versus the charge transport material. All right, and the device characteristics are better than straight P3HT. All right, in addition to that, uh, we can have a fairly tight bending radius and be able to maintain integrity and device characteristics. And these are the transfer curves. Um, I also have to say that I had a very patient student who did this work because he did go up to about 1,000 bends. And as I understand it, this was not a mechanical device set up to do it by itself. He very patiently bent the system himself. So, and the results are pretty impressive. That by, again, by taking advantage of sort of the solubility characteristics of one polymer in another polymer, that we can manipulate the organization of the charge transport material within that matrix and have a positive impact on the mechanical properties and the device substrates that we can use. All right, so from the standpoint of flexibility on a variety of different substrates, that can be easily addressed by appropriate choice of a blended polymer system. I think as we go forward, what we need to do is look at alternative solvents so that we have systems that aren't going to be hazardous to somebody's health if they're using it in a fabrication environment. And that's going to require both chemistry in terms of the design of the polymers so that they will have the appropriate solubility characteristics, but it also needs to be coupled with sort of the process science and engineering approach of optimizing how we actually develop robust processes for using these materials in fabrication environments. And then we also have to look at how we actually prepare these samples, and are the fabrication methods also scalable? So can we really develop roll-to-roll -roll processes? Can we develop additive manufacturing processes? All right, and, and so there are a lot of exciting opportunities really involving not only the science, but also the engineering of conjugated systems for devices. All right, so Really, it's a combination of the molecular structure with the processing that is going to influence the electronic properties of these materials. Uh, I think we do need to work in a concerted way where it's not just one piece of this triangle. I think it's thinking about all aspects that are involved in device fabrication. I, and we also need to understand, but more importantly, control all of the interfaces in these materials, whether we're talking about interfaces 
between the conjugated polymers themselves, interfaces with the dielectric substrate, interfaces with conductors. We need to think about all of those interfaces. And then finally, uh, certainly, I did not do the work myself. Uh, there are a lot of people I need to thank uh, who were involved in the work that I presented today, a small number of whom are presented here. Uh, and I need to thank the funding agencies and you for listening. And I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. Thanks. Okay. So um, you kind of alluded to it at the end that one of the keys is making sure that the observations you see with, for example, spin coating of your materials is applicable and transfers to other manufacturing right. techniques like inkjet deposition or some other thing. Right. Have you kind of begun to look at that? So we, we actually have started to look at that. And a lot of the work in that regard is, is now in a collaboration between myself and Martha Grover. And, and we have a couple of joint students who are really looking at sort of the, from the process perspective, being able to model the actual process and evolution of the thin film morphology. And from the knowledge that we get there, we also want to explore can we now transfer and use those models to start modeling the process and the process characteristics for, let's say, blade coating or slot die coating? Uh, and I think inkjet printing is another opportunity. So that's in process. Thanks.